Can I welcome everyone to the sixth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? Apologies have been received from Joanne Lamont and Fulton McGregor. Joanne is unwell and Fulton is unable to attend. Agenda item one is an item in private. The first item of business is to consider taking item four in private. The committee will be discussing its approach to scrutiny of an LCM. Are we agreed that we will take item four in private? Thank you. The next item of business is a panel on curriculum for excellence. This is the fifth of six panels providing an overview of key areas of the committee's remit. These sessions will inform consideration of our priorities for this parliamentary session. And I welcome this morning Keir Bloomer, Convener of the Education Committee, Royal Society of Edinburgh, Dr Janet Brown, Chief Executive of the Scottish Qualifications Authority, Anne Grant, Head Teacher at Shawlands Academy, and Susan Quinn, Education Committee Convener, Educational Institute of Scotland. I understand that Keir Bloomer may at times comment in a personal capacity or as a member of the Reform Scotland Advisory Board. Please just clarify whenever you feel necessary what capacity you are speaking in, just to make things simpler for the committee. Thank you very much. We'll go straight to questions, and I will begin by asking, I suppose, the panel in this case, the, the degree to which original intentions of the reforms have been met. Uh, I'll start with you, Susan. Um, the, the evidence that's come forward is that, to, to some extent, we've seen um, the, the original intentions of CFE taken forward. Considerations around um, changes to pedagogical approaches, particularly in the early years and, and primary sectors um, within the BGE, are, are, are clearly developed um, over the years. Aspects around the four capacities certainly form a, a, a great um, focus for schools and, and establishments in terms of their work and in terms of how they um, assess and report on young people in, in, in those areas. I think there are, there are clearly from the OECD report and others um, areas of evaluation through Education Scotland and, and even within our own membership that there are aspects of the original principles which um, perhaps have not been met, moving to um, less um, assessment, less formal assessment for young people hasn't been realised in, in, in our opinion across all of the sectors that are still um, assessment burdens within the BGE and in, in the qualification stages. We still see um, some issues around the, the curriculum being overcrowded and that was clearly one of the original intents was to consider how the, the curriculum could be decluttered, um, if you like, in terms of what was there from 5 to 14. So I think there are, there are merits to what has been taken forward in the original intent, um, but there are, there are specifics which still need to be worked on in order to realise the, the full, full original um, aims. Do, and do you have any reasons that you can give for, it, for any move away from the original ob objectives? Um, I don't know that it was a move away from the original objectives. It's just a, not a, a realisation of, of what was intended. So um, the over-assessment um, has come in, in the primary sector because of um, the E's and O's being um, assessed on in, an individual basis in some establishments or becoming a tick box exercise in relation to assessment um, across the, the national qualifications in terms of the, the unit assessments and the challenges around that which have been um, aired within your, your documents but within the, the national review group have, have been considered. So in terms of assessment um, it's just not a rounded off a, a approach to, to assessment and where teachers' professional judgment has been um, classed as being the, you know, the, the aim, what we aren't seeing is a, a, a backing up of that in terms of, of, of other aspects. So it's teachers' professional judgment, but we want to have um, standardised tests to, to back that up. We want to have... Um, you know, more um, paperwork to back it up to be sure that we've got evidence that <coughs> teachers' professional judgment is actually there. And in terms of the, the, the curriculum, um, what we haven't had, I think, in the primary sector is, is strong enough guidance in terms of curriculum architecture to allow for the curricular areas to be developed in a, 
a way that the curriculum is less crowded. So what we have in, within the primary sector are a whole range of very um, worthwhile um, approaches to, to the curriculum. You know, schools develop their focus weeks around green issues, literacy week, numeracy week, financial education week, do, 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 do. but no joining up of the dots in terms of how that then looks when you take a, a, a 25 hour pupil day over a 39 week pupil year and how that then can, can see can, how these things can then overtake. And I suppose in terms of the BGE, it's then about whether or not um, what we're seeing is, a, is an understanding of a curriculum architecture that would allow for the um, worthwhile approaches to education that are being developed to sit within a structure that doesn't then mean that you're just jumping from one thing to the next and not getting the depth and balance that you want. Okay, thank you, Anne. Would you... Yes, um, I'm a, thank, you, thank you for the opportunity of uh, speaking this morning. Um, obviously, I can only speak on behalf of my own school. I can't talk for uh, secondary education in general. However, I, I, I do have to emphasise that I am an optimist and I'm very positive about what's happening in terms of uh, curriculum for excellence. I think it's given us the opportunity as a profession to look carefully at the curriculum. I think that the idea of having a progression from 3 to 18 was a very positive one. I think the clarity in terms of uh, the, the, the four capacities was a very, very strong statement for the profession. And I think that um, the, the, uh, the, the, the emphasis in terms of pedagogy uh, it was also very, very important. Um, I think it's been a, it's, it's, I think the OECD spoke about it being at a watershed. And I think where we are in terms of Scottish education is that we have that chance to really take education forward uh, from what we've ha from what's happened so far we, that we can we can take that forward. I do agree that there's issues that we need to look at um, in terms of assessment. I think that was something where the perfect that certainly we we tried to make sure that in, in Shawlands that when we were um, planning we were looking at the E's and O's. I don't think that we went into uh, looking at the E's and O's and as as a way of using that as assessment, um, I think it's perhaps different in the secondary sector. We were able to, to look at the E's and O's in different ways. But I do think the kind of assessment burden was, was an issue, but I'm delighted that that's been looked at now, and I think that's going to make a significant difference. So as I say, I'm an optimist, and I believe that, that, that it's, it's, a, it's a good time in Scottish education. Thank you very much. Dr Byrne. Um, I, I think one of the challenges of, of CFE is any change takes a particularly um, strong period of time to be able to bed in. And I think teachers have done a really good job in terms of understanding what is the nature of what CFE is trying to, to undertake. Part of that, as has been mentioned previously, is that depth and breadth of learning. And I think one of the challenges is to, is to look at what are we trying to achieve within education? And, and there are obvious milestones that people hit, such as qualifications when they get to the senior phase, but it's about what is the learning and the, and the, and the growth of those individuals as they approach that qualification that I think is critical. And, and I think it's, it's, it's very important that the, the depth of learning is, is really essential. It's not just a matter of jumping through the hoop of getting through a qualification. It's actually about the ability to apply that knowledge, the ability to put it in different contexts, and the ability to do that. And that, I think, is starting to really come through in some of the, some of the things that we've seen, for instance, in the last diet. Um, the contextualisation of learning, I think, is something that was another aspect for CFE, because one of the things that uh, the, 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 the teachers in the room are probably much better to talk about than I am, is about the fact that, that learners learn better if they're interested and they're excited by the context in which they're learning. CFE really gives that ability, and one of the things that I think um, we've, we've con we continue to, to develop in across the system is the ability to put that learning in a context that excites the individual. If you're learning about angular momentum with a pendulum, it's particularly boring. But if you're learning about it in a racing car or you're learning about it in a different context, you get kids interested. And that, that is possible and is being done across CFE. So that, for me, is a very positive thing. Uh, and associated with that is the whole idea of personalization and choice, not just in how you learn something, but also in what you learn. We've seen over the last um, 
the, the last set of qualification structures that, we, that we've run the last three years, that that personalization and the choice is increasing. When we first started out with, with the, exam, the examples that we put out in terms of um, the nature of how you could teach particular things in the national courses, a lot of teachers used those particular examples. So for instance, in environmental science, the wind farm was generally what everyone taught the environmental science around. As the teachers are getting much more confident, much more comfortable with it, we're starting to see different contexts, which I think will really help in terms of that excitement and that personalization for the, for the students. The, the broadening of the curriculum, I think, is the, the other aspect of, of what CFE was about, which is not just focusing on the national qualifications, the national four, five hires and advanced hires. I think that's a cultural shift that the country needs to go through. It's not just schools. It's also about what are parents um, expecting their, 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 their children to be doing. We're starting to see a bit more of, um, uh, of take up of the other aspects of, of learning within, within the school. And I think that's hugely positive, but it is a cultural shift that I think still needs to, go, to be gone through as a country. Um, I think me there were many different goals that were associated with CFE. I think some of them were well on the way to. Some of them we know we need to get there and others we're reassessing. The, the word assessment there I think is very appropriate. We, uh, as, as the committee is aware, we did a, um, a piece of work at the beginning, at the end of last year, beginning this year, to look at how the qualifications had worked and the role of assessment. We identified that the unit assessments were actually causing issues within schools and we put in place some uh, actions to, to undertake that. The, the Deputy First Minister has decided to um, take a, the approach that we remove unit assessments and I think as been said, that should free up some time for uh, additional teaching and learning within the courses. However, it's really important that the courses are given the appropriate amount of time for students to be able to learn them because that is a real issue around depth and breadth of learning. So I think it's a, it, it is a good journey that we're on, and I think we've made a lot of progress, and we continue to do so. OK, thank you very much, Mr Bloomer. Strictly speaking, none of us can answer your question. Thank you very much. We uh, do not know what progress has been made because no serious attempt has been made to evaluate it. And this is the most significant uh, development that has taken place in Scottish education <coughs> since the war, and no evaluation system was set up at the outset. There's not even any baseline on which to make comparisons. That's a very serious uh, shortcoming in the, in the programme, and one of the things that the RSE has consistently argued for is proper independent research and evaluation of, of what is going on. I mean, successive governments have made claims of success in relation to Curriculum for Excellence, and to be honest with you, they are based on no evidence whatsoever. Uh, we can all have impressions, and indeed, the OECD report backs up those impressions. I mean, it says a lot of positive things about Curriculum for Excellence. It puts it in the mainstream of educational developments globally, in my view, quite rightly. Uh, and it points to things that have taken place uh, w within the context of Curriculum for Excellence, which are indeed very positive. I don't disagree with any of the positives that my uh, colleagues here have have mentioned, but I think it is important to stress that the evidence to support it simply isn't there. Um, what I think we can say with some degree of confidence is that there has been significant change in pedagogy. Uh, there has been a greater emphasis on depth in learning, which is extremely important. Although, as uh, Susan Quinn pointed out to you, the, the flip side of that has not taken place. You cannot really get depth of learning unless the time and space is available for it, and that is dependent upon the original intention in Curriculum for Excellence to declutter. And we have not been successful in decluttering. If you want a little e bit of evidence of that, I would refer you to page 44 of the OECD report, where it says this. They, they had examined all of the guidance uh, that has been issued in relation to curriculum for excellence and found that the guidance contained four capacities, 12 attributes, 24 capabilities, five levels, seven principles, six entitlements, 10 aims, eight curriculum areas, four contexts for learning and 1,820 experiences and outcomes. Now that is self-evident lunacy. We have allowed mountains 
of uh, guidance, much of it very badly written, uh, nearly incomprehensible to accumulate over the years, and that now stands in the way of the decluttering of the curriculum. I'm pleased to see that the Cabinet Secretary is determined to do something about it. Slightly unfortunate that the most recent attempt to do something about it has, issued, has resulted in the issue of a further 99 pages of guidance, but uh, it will be nice to think that the, the next attempt will be more successful than that one. Thank you very much for that positive outcome. Uh, Liz, would you like to? Could I just pick you up on uh, that point? Why do you think that that happened? Why did we end up in a scenario where we had uh, so many different uh, pieces of jargon when we were trying to assess the curriculum for excellence? Why did it happen? I think that's a very good question, a very important question, why did it happen? In my view, reviewing now the 12 years since the original curriculum for excellence document was produced, it seems to me that there have been some political mistakes, but that most of the mistakes that have been made have actually been made by the leadership of the profession. That the quality of advice that governments have received has not been strong, and that there has been a lack of strategic overview of the process as a whole, with the result that what has taken place is that guidance has been added to uh, in fact, it has multiplied rather than added. Um, and a, the overall consequence of that has been to obscure rather than to illuminate. Uh, thank you. you. You mentioned in your uh, submission to the committee that you feel that there are issues uh, with the delivery plan for Education Scotland, um, which might relate to staffing, capacity, capability and resources. And you go on to say that they need to demonstrate an increased willingness to consult widely with the profession and to take proper account of comment received. Now, I think that paper is from the Royal Society rather than from you personally. Could you comment on that? Yes, certainly. Um, the Royal Society actually welcomes the delivery plan in general. Um, we, have very we find very little in it with which we disagree. There are one or two things. Um, we are concerned about its manageability. And if you look through the development plan, some of the points contain actually several actions. I tried to count up the actions, and I came to 117. Now, I think a delivery plan with 117 uh, separate actions is in danger of becoming unmanageable. When combined with the very demanding timescales that are set within the delivery plan, uh, I think it will be very difficult to take the profession along with all aspects of it. So there are some difficulties, I think, but a large proportion of the actions fall to be carried out uh, by Education Scotland. Now, uh, one of the things that has concerned me just in the last few weeks uh, has been the choice of Education Scotland or the inspectorate part of it to look at uh, bureaucracy and unnecessary workload. Um, to be fair to them, they were asked to do it by the Cabinet Secretary. They didn't take on the role themselves. If they had done, it would have been simply a grotesque impertinence, uh, given the fact that they are responsible for very much of the uh, uh, unnecessary workload and unnecessary uh, documentation that is involved in Curriculum for Excellence. If they're to be involved in uh, slimming this down and taking forward the many actions of the delivery plan, then there are serious capacity issues uh, that have to be addressed. I, I think there's also uh, something of a reprogramming exercise will have to be undertaken. Okay, thank you. Could I just finish my uh, initial questions uh, with Mrs Grant? Do you feel, uh, as a head teacher, that your staff have been compromised in trying to deliver on the curriculum for excellence because of the, uh, the number of things that they're asked to do and because of the jargon that has gone with that and the difficulty of interpreting outcomes and experiences? I think that um, <clears throat> I think in, in any profession there is jargon, and I think that my staff are used to the jargon um, of, of curriculum for excellence. Certainly hope they are. It's my job to make sure they are. Um, and I, I, but I do think there's a, a recognition nationally that there's been a lot of information given out um, and that, that there's been a lot of information which, is, which has been um, well-meaning and helpful um, in its intention, 
but um, I must admit that I am very pleased to note that the intention will be that there will be a, a four pathways in a new uh, Education Scotland website which should make um, the accessing of resources and accessing of information much more manageable. I also note that um, within that, that, that there will be a specific one for, 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 for staff and that that will be slimmed down information. I think perhaps one of the issues has been that information has been added to and information hasn't then been taken away. So that it, um, I think that process will actually make things much more meaningful. Basically, in terms of what my, the teachers in my school are doing, they're delivering everyday education, they're delivering for young people, and our focus has been very much on making sure that what happens in the classroom, what happens in terms of learning and teaching is of the best, and it's been my job to, to filter that information to staff. I've seen that as my role as head teacher, to make sure that as a, a member of um, Glasgow City Council, I listen to what Glasgow's saying. As a teacher within Scottish education, I listen to what's happening nationally. It's also my job to make sure that the priorities for my own school, um, we, we agree and that we focus on. So it's been my job to make sure that I filter that, I make sure that people have been aware of things. Um, and therefore, I would hope, they're not here, but I would hope that um, the staff feel, would still feel, feel comfortable in the kind of tasks we've been asked to do. However, as I say, the fact that the website will be um, slimmed down, I think, is, is again, only a, only, a, only a good thing. Thank you. Tavis, you wanted to come in there. Thank you. Uh, Convener, just two supplementaries. Um, just in response uh, to your answer, Mrs Grant, to Liz Smith, um, is your view, as we have seen, uh, in terms of the information that's come out from the centre, has that come from Education Scotland, or has it come, I mean, in terms of curriculums of excellence, or has it come from uh, your local education authority? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the, the kind of information we get from both Education Scotland and uh, Glasgow City Council. Glasgow City Council obviously works within the, the parameters. When we do an improvement plan, we, we follow Glasgow City Council policies, um, which are the priorities that are set by Glasgow City Council, but they are set within the context that's nationally. So, um, in terms of answering your question, we, we respond both to Glasgow City Council and nationally, but again, in the same way as I filter the information, Glasgow City Council has that, that, that function too. Um, and so that the a point about having to do all this filtering, yeah. but this is coming from somewhere. Yes. So curriculum for excellence is coming from Education Scotland, as Mr. Bloomer was suggesting earlier on. I think I think uh, I think it is. Yes, yeah. I think that, that's that's a, a fair statement. Yes. That okay. curriculum for excellence. Well, it, it's, all, it's also has engaged the, the, the profession in a dialogue. I mean, I, I, I do genuinely believe that teachers have been empowered to discuss issues in terms of learning yeah. and teaching. That they have that yeah. capability, and I feel that uh, within the council I work in, I have a, a certain degree of autonomy in terms of um, organising what, what we need to do to make sure we deliver best for the young people. Okay, thank you. And I was just going to ask Mr. Bloomer. When does want to come in at this point? Can I just? important to reflect on where we were before CFE and where we were before CFE were that teachers were given and told what to do and they were they were they were almost reporting in the in the national debate that the, it was robotic in terms of what they were being instructed mm -hmm. to deliver on and what we were trying to do was reprofessionalize and bring teachers into into the conversation so that they were making professional judgments around the context that their young people were learning in in relation to that so over time the advice notes and, and documents in relation to that which have gone come through Education Scotland, have gone through the CFE management board, of which all the stakeholders are engaged in, have added to that advice in response to the questions that have been asked by the profession or by others. And, and, and Anne's right, sometimes what you have what hasn't happened is the removal to, to make sure there isn't duplication or, or otherwise in the in the conversation. What we get reported is often that it's then how that's um, delivered at local level in relation to to, to local authority, mm -hmm. and so it is that that challenge of what what advice are given. We know that some local authorities um, took a very firm approach to it and went, right, we're all going to do the same tracking <coughs> system, the same reporting system, and you were back where you started <coughs> with schools being told what it should look like for their young people, regardless of the context they were in. There are others where they, perhaps the local input has, has not been as helpful in, in any way because it's just been, well, it's there, design your own things. 
And then we would contest that there's probably the happy medium somewhere in the middle of that, where supportive advice has been given locally to ensure that curriculum design, assessment, moderation, tracking, reporting are done in a way which meets the needs of the establishments, the parents, the young people that are within that, and the challenge is then how to do it. And if I take, for instance, the E's and O's and um, where we are now... Just for the record, you maybe should say what E's and O's are, because Sorry, it's all yeah, jargon. Okay, and, the, yeah. the experiences and outcomes, yeah. which are the... the, the the building blocks of each of the, sure. the curricular yeah. areas. We're all meant to know this, but, you know. Um, I, I, I do recall that each time we come before them, it's different committees, mm. yes. Um, so, at the point where they were introduced, um, they needed, I think, to be the way they were to allow the move from people who took the 5 to 14 mm. book and just went through it. Mm. You needed that shift... And then we needed to, to develop back, you know, and to, to get the, the more structure around, around things, excuse me. And I think that's part of the problem with it, is that at the point where CFE was, was starting out, we were in a different climate in terms of finances and otherwise in education. So there was a bit more time and space that could be created. I think to my own circumstances where you could create um, professional learning opportunities for teachers because there was enough staff there to be able to, to free up time. We're now in a situation where that time and space isn't as readily available mm -hmm. and therefore it becomes more challenging to, to take this forward. And I think where um, Education Scotland have responded is to then look at these no's and to look at how that then has been um, interpreted in a particular way and looked at the significant aspects of learning which take that a wee bit further forward and maybe give more clarity mm. around the assessment um, issues and around the work that, that's done within, within schools. I think probably the answer to your question is there's a bit too much from everybody. It's, there's, there's, there's lots of different things in lots of different places yeah. and it's that consistency. So, so local... You know, some of our our, um, our members will report that locally they're being instructed too much, and in others they'll be reporting that they're not getting enough mm. support. And it's the it's the balancing act around around mm. those. But the key issue around where we're at now is how we create the time and space mm. to review what's happening, whether it's locally in an establishment, locally in a, a local authority or nationally where we are in terms of CFE and how we make sure then that um, the BGE is delivered in terms of the, in the, in the initial intentions, broad general education, um, which is where we're at from you know, 3 to mm. 15 before sure. we get into qualification stages because I think that's where we would have major concerns about how, how far that has been delivered mm. and, and how far that, that, has, that has gone and where it disappears when you get to the secondary stage as things become more focused on qualifications. Yeah, that sounds very fair to me. Um, can I just ask one supplementary to Mr Bloomer in the context again of Liz Smith's questions? Um, your submission from the Royal Society is that it is incompatible for Education Scotland to have both the inspection function on one hand and all the guidance that you've all described this on the other hand. Is, is the logic that this, as the OECD in my view hints at, should change in the future? Yes. Um, that is a, a fundamental and irreconcilable conflict of mm. interest which is built into the organisation. Mm. That's not the organisation's fault, no, of course, absolutely. Um, yeah. but it is there and it has to be resolved. We cannot have an agency that is responsible for development inspecting its own work. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank you for that. Daniel, you wanted to come in on this? Yeah, it follows on from the, 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 the points that, that, that you were just making, uh, Susan, and I think that... I think in the introductory remarks, I think what, what stands out is the, 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 the situation where we have, uh, you know, addition to, to the guidance and I think a kind of, a, I think, issues around joining things up. And certainly when I've been going around prime, you know, schools, and especially primary schools, actually, asking what does curriculum for excellence mean? And I'm being shown big binders um, where they're having to, to then essentially map out how kind of the learning outcomes are going to work and how they're going to deliver it so they don't have those kind of gaps. So I was maybe just wanting to ask... Uh, and grant, you know, what, 
what in a practical sense you know, is required for you to actually implement curriculum for excellence, you know, just really following on from the point that, that, that Susan Quinn was just making? There was a time when we were issued with, um, with, um, with big green binders and that, that did, and it was, as I say, within the, the context of being helpful and being supportive so that staff were being uh, given materials that they could use as professionals. And I think that was it's very much part of the, um, the, the whole notion that, following Macron, that teachers are um, professionals who have autonomy within their own classroom in terms of the kind of work that, that can take place. And, and we, we, we don't really use those. I think that, in, in, as someone has mentioned before, I think it was uh, my colleague on my left, Jan, Dr Janet Brown, mentioned the fact that change does take place over time. And over time, the, the, the way people have worked with regard to the information has altered. So that a lot of it is online. A lot of the information is online. There's a lot of discussion in, sure. in departments and in faculties within a secondary school. There's a there's this discussion across departments in different schools, so that people of different of the same curricular area will get together and discuss issues um, and support each other in that way. And that collegiate approach is a very is, is very much a strength of what's happening in the teaching profession. So it's not really a, a case of a, a teacher sitting with, with a, a, a green binder and taking things off or reading, reading through that in isolation. That, that, those days have kind of gone, if they, ever, if they ever really existed. It really is now a case of people working together collegiately, looking at information online, sharing good practice, learning from each other um, in terms of um, meeting the needs. The issue in terms of one aspect, I think, is that teachers are very concerned that we always do the best for young people. And therefore, there, there's, a, there's a, a necessity to ensure that nothing's been missed or that someone's not doing their job well enough. As an individual, a teacher wants to make sure that they are actually meeting the entitlements of young, of young people which are built into, the, into Curriculum for Excellence. So there can be a, a desire to make sure that's happening. And that's when you can go back to look at, to look at lists and check you're doing things. But the ease and those, the experience and, the, and outcomes um, which are for each curricular area are very much to do with planning, and uh, the new statement indicates that the planning should not be short. Should, in terms of short-term planning, should be um, in one way, but the longer-term planning should be looking at ease and those across across a year. And that would be something that someone would a session. I mean, that would be something that uh, teachers would get together and discuss what they're going to do in terms of meeting the curricular aims within their own curricular area. So, 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 in terms and. I don't disagree with, with Anne. I think, but, however, what's reported often to us is that where collegiate working takes place, things go along very smoothly. The difficulty can be where, um, whether it's within a secondary school and departments are all doing their own things, that the, the bureaucracy has built up around um, how you track and monitor and, and record some of what you're doing. It's not the, what's been delivered that's the the issue in and of itself, it's how you're evidencing that and how that's, that's going. Within the primary sector, one of the biggest issues has, has been that the E's and O's have sat there and primary schools have planned around those and are now planning around, moving towards planning around the significant aspects of learning in, in, the, in that way. But on top of that, you have... Um, special interests that get added in to the curriculum. So you have one plus two languages. Yeah, you have yeah, the yeah, science yeah. lobby saying we need to have more STEM work. You have um, the, the, the desire for schools to be rights respecting, have a green flag, um, be fair trade schools, things. Now, all of these... Um, events in and of themselves are worthwhile to the learner's experience. However, very often what schools are not doing is deciding on one against the other right. and saying, well, that covers all of what we need to do or the vast majority of what we need to do. Actually, what they want to do is everything. And that has become a problem. That's where we've, be we've gone back to, and that's exactly what happened in, in 5 to 14. We were overcrowded because we were trying to act, do too much yeah. of, um, of things which are genuinely worthwhile to young people, but actually not if you're trying to do them all. Yeah. So it is then about saying, right, okay, 
which are the which are the, the key priorities for this session? Are we able to 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 use that? And does that cover all of the significant so, aspects of learning we need to do? Yeah. So the thing that struck me was just the volume of work that that's being undertaken by primary schools, I think, in particular, to actually make the curriculum usable. And and and, and I I I I'm I mean, I just wondering if if that is. Do you think that's an accurate reflection? Do you think that's mm. something that's that's that, that, that's widespread? And then, if that's the case, is it what we need? Isn't I think we talk a lot about streamlining, and I think that the, the the instinct is to think about well, that means less guidance. And I just wonder whether or not actually what we need is better guidance rather than necessarily less. I think um, in terms of in terms of the prime, um, Keir said uh, what we need somewhere around here is a, a system shift. Some of what has happened around the curriculum is that we've taken new jargon and we've tried to make it fit with what we always did. We've changed some pedagogy in terms of approaches to learning within, within schools and, and that has, that has um, taken off in lots of ways. But we're still trying to fit it around a similar model to what we did previously. Yeah. So when I started teaching I think 25 years ago, we would have an hour and a half of language in the morning, an hour and a half of maths in the morning, and that would leave you know, two hours of everything else for the afternoons. And what we've done with CFE isn't say, right, let's look at that five hours or that 25 hours a, a week differently, or um, look at the 25 hours a week over each of the weeks differently. We're still in too many establishments trying to do the exact same curriculum design, but with more stuff. So we're squeezing in, you know, two hours of PE a week. Once you take the two hours out of the 25, you're, you know, you're, you're getting, and then you've got your languages. We're trying to, we're having, the, it's the, the curriculum design from three through to the end of, of the, the learners, learn, uh, you know, education hasn't shifted enough. So you're saying we've not quite added up the time required to do all the things that we're asking to happen, is that...? Well, there's, a, there's a bit of that. Yeah. There is a bit of that that, you know, you need to... But once you add it up, if we're still saying that you still have to... We still have to be um, looking at two hours of PE and having, you know, one plus two languages and things which are have been... Um, agreed or otherwise that these these are going to be worthwhile for our young people in terms of um, their their on, ongoing life skills. Then what you need to do is you need to look at how that's delivered across a, a young person's um, educational experience. And so some of what's come out now in terms of um, the reporting is that you know you don't need to be doing every curricular area every week. Now in the primary sector generally. We're still probably trying to do a bit of art, a bit of music, a bit of drama, a bit of every week. There isn't, and, and that's where we need better examples within the primary sector of what a, the curriculum architecture would look around this in order to allow us to, to make sure that the young people get the best experience. Because teachers are really only doing what they know, and they've not, you know, they've not, we've not got that structure to it. So. Better, a better guidance around primary curricular architecture. Better guidance, I think, probably in terms of BGE in S1 to 3. I think there is a real miss and a real um, problem with the fact that we haven't, um, haven't got that consistent across the country in terms of what young people's experience of the broad general education to the end of S3. And that's partly to do with the fact that we haven't gone wholesale for the original principles around the qualifications, which should be that generally it, it was a, you know, the national fives and, and hires were a two year qualification yeah. and, and architecture around that. So what we're seeing is that, again, at secondary, we're just modeling in lots of cases what we, what we, used, we used to have. So instead of standard grades and hires, we've got national fives and and national fours and hires, and we're doing it in exactly the same way, and we've not moved enough around that. Yeah. No, I think your, your educational architecture point, I think, is absolutely reflects what I've been hearing over the summer, so, so thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, Colin. Thank you, Vera. I think uh, almost inevitably the conversation has sort of drifted towards bureaucracy and uh, streamlining guidance. 
Um, and there has been a, a great deal about, uh, from teachers' concerns about the volume and quality of the guidance that's been issued. There's been, over a period now, there's been quite a few initiatives uh, in connection with reducing the bureaucracy. And from what you're saying, this has not been as successful as it might have been. Um, indeed, uh, it just in August there, the uh, Education Scotland said that there's currently too much support material and guidance for practitioners. Yeah, I seem to remember a few months ago there was concern that there wasn't enough guidance issued in certain respects. How do we get that balance? <coughs> I, th I think one of the challenges is, I, I agree with everything everyone said about, um, we've, we've provided more and more support and we've added and we haven't necessarily gone back and looked at modifying rather than adding. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, th th how, do, how do we make sure that we, that we improve the amount of support and, and the nature of the support that's, that's given? Uh, it is about actually understanding from the teachers what they need. And I think um, we, we, we need a lot more conversations about what, what does a teacher in a context require and how easy is it for them to get that. Um, right now, we, we produce, um, mul not, the system produces um, documents that cover multiple things. I think one, one of the challenges is, is how do we actually give uh, support and guidance in a way that is timely, appropriate, and just in time for when teachers need it. And that is arguably smaller pieces of advice, smaller pieces of support that, that teachers can use on a daily basis. That, that is a challenge to do, um, and it is a challenge to tailor it to, to the requirements of, of a variety of different contexts. Um, for, for me, the, the whole issue of support is also what's been talked about in terms of teachers getting together. One of the philosophies of CFE was about the profession meeting together, sharing experiences, sharing support uh, at both the school, local, local authority and national level. I think you can see really good examples of that across the country, but you can also see areas of the country where that has not happened. And I think teachers are sort of left, um, schools are left with, with uh, not as much peer support as, that, uh, as they could get. From the experience of SQA in the senior phase, the most positive feedback that we get is when we run events and we bring teachers together. And I think teachers getting together is a really, really key thing in here. And one of the challenges is allowing teachers the time to be able to do that. Thank you. I think part of the problem lies in the word guidance. In a sense, it's a weasel word, because sometimes it means instruction and sometimes it means suggestion. And it's really important to distinguish between these two things. The essential role of government and its agencies is to provide clear strategic advice that is limited, manageable, memorable. The scope for any amount of suggestion, there is no reason why uh, the Education Scotland website or uh, any other uh, source of information can't contain limitless amounts of suggestion to teachers which they can look at or not, adopt or not, as they see fit. But that is something very different from the strategic role of guidance, the, the bit which is essentially instruction, which has to be, in my view, very limited in its nature. So far as the suggestion side is concerned, I think that what Janet has just said is perfectly correct. What do teachers need? Uh, the, the suggestion element needs to be teacher-led. It needs to be a response to difficulties or problems or issues that teachers are genuinely experiencing <coughs> rather than gratuitous advice uh, thrown out from the centre regardless of whether or not it's answering any need uh, in the classroom. Underpinning all of this, it seems to me, is uh, the problem of how to bring about change in a complex system. And it seems to me we still have some considerable way to go in understanding that process. The first step in understanding it is the separation of the genuinely strategic from the operational and the permissive, as it were. Um, a further stage in it is understanding the nature of iterative change, you know, change which takes place not all at once, but gradually over time, 
with successive changes building upon the experience of previous changes, eliminating weaknesses and emphasising strengths. Um, and we have really not succeeded in doing that. Um, take just two examples of that. One is the experiences and outcomes which have been referred to. Experiences and outcomes uh, are a serious attempt to build a curriculum on the basis of uh, the skills and the knowledge that young people are actually acquiring. The, the notion behind the experiences and outcomes is that they will define, in each case, what it is that the learner should be able to do at the end of the experience that they weren't able to do at the beginning. Now, that is a perfectly sensible and highly innovative way of building a curriculum, and I think that the Scottish attempt has probably been the most thoroughgoing of any in the world so far. Which is not to say that the experiences and outcomes are without their failings. They've got lots of failings. There are far too many of them. Many, probably most, are obscurely worded and require a kind of textual exegesis on the part of uh, teachers that they shouldn't be asked to undertake uh, on a daily basis. Um, they differ in kind. So, in many instances, uh, they break down learning into comparatively small steps, which I think is what they're supposed to do. In other cases, for example, the health and well-being ones, and this is an area which is regarded as uh, crucially significant by government, there is no progression built into them whatsoever. They cover every level from early to fourth uh, in, the, in the form of aspirational statements, and that's completely useless. Uh, now, they have been around now for something like eight years. Uh, we should have been going through a process of iterative change whereby we refine uh, our approach to the experiences and outcomes and they become steadily more useful. But we haven't actually done that. What we've done is uh, duplicate them, first of all by the significant aspects of learning, which were really a, a recognition that the experiences and outcomes were too many and too complex, and here is a simpler system for you. Um, Susan referred to them. My impression is that they're no longer current, that they've just been replaced by the newly issued uh, benchmarks. Um, if that is not the case, then we've actually now got three systems of essentially the, the same thing, which is a strange approach to simplification, I would have thought. So there is a need to look seriously at how you bring about change and uh, then to dramatically simplify uh, what is on offer. The, the other uh, area of this is the building the curriculum series. Nobody's mentioned that yet, but it is supposed to be the high-level guidance, the genuinely strategic guidance in relation to curriculum for excellence. And it contains, particularly in uh, the third of the series, uh, which is about curriculum structure, much that is useful it's very repetitive and um, badly written, but much that is useful uh, within the document. Um, but there is no sense of the planning of the series overall. So, for example, interdisciplinary learning was mentioned, which is a key part of Curriculum for Excellence, with which teachers were not familiar. There is no building the curriculum document that deals with that. Whereas curriculum uh, areas uh, receives attention from building the curriculum one, and it, in fact, is an area with which teachers were totally familiar. Most of them could have written Building the Curriculum One in their sleep. Um, so there is, in the overall architecture of uh, the guidance that is on offer, no coherence, no overall strategic plan. So those, to my mind, are, are, are the crucial things. We need to be genuinely strategic. We need to demote much of what has been published to the level of uh, suggestion, we need to empower teachers to operate within limited strategic guidelines showing initiative of their own. But if we perhaps do what you suggest and simplify the guidance and make it more limited in nature, which, which is your words, Mr Blumer, are we not in danger of oversimplification here and that we might end up with a tick box approach? I think not. I think the opposite. Uh, either you trust the teaching profession or you don't. The whole philosophy of uh, curriculum for excellence is that you trust the profession, that you set a sense of direction and curriculum for excellence 
set a sense of direction that was widely welcomed and agreed. Nobody at all, I think, queried the principles of curriculum for excellence at the outset. You supplement that with a limited amount of strategic advice and you trust the profession then to implement it. That, to my mind, is the way in which you uh, achieve genuine change and we have done too little of it. Perhaps I can just uh, turn to the bureaucracy side, which has uh, been very, very uh, well publicised. There seems to be a bit of a debate as to where, do, where that bureaucracy is coming from. Is it, is it predominantly from national government? Is it predominantly from local government? I see RSC seem to, in their very last sentence here, say that... Uh, uh, the implication in this action that local authorities have been more responsible in government and national agencies in generating unnecessary workload. Where is it coming from? Where is it really coming from? It's, it's depends where, it depends where you work. It, the, the, that, and that, that's the, the, the genuine answer around it. Do you mean different educational authorities are different? Different educational authorities, different educational establishments. So... Keir's right, if you trust teachers and you are working with them as a head teacher, then you shouldn't require them to fill in lots of bits of paper. You should be able to have conversations with them around how young people are progressing. The quality of conversation within the, the timescale that CFE has been implemented um, is significantly better for lots of um, establishments because they spend time talking to each other. Where um, head teachers are um, less confident in the conversations, they tend to have boxes of ring binders of tick box things, which prove nothing other than a teacher can tick boxes. Um, similarly, around forward planning, if you have um, beautiful forward plans, all it proves is that you are really good at writing a beautiful forward plan. It doesn't prove that you are delivering quality learning and teaching to young people. And what teachers, we were asked, what, what is it that teachers want? Teachers want time and space to deliver quality learning and teaching. They want time and space to have the kinds of conversations that Janet talked about with peers within their own establishments and in the wider communities. But there isn't time to do that because, in lots of cases, what they're still doing is replicating the old system of a, a termly plan, which is handed in and maybe discussed or maybe marked or maybe handed back, and then daily plans and, in some cases, weekly plans and tick boxes of, of assessment folders and, and all sorts of stuff. And that will depend on where you work whether it's because it's dictated or um, prescribed by your local authority in their systems, or whether it's where what happens within your establishment. But, but this is, this is and, alarming in its own well, way, because if there is such a diversity of bureaucracy uh, deriving from lo just local authorities, from the local schools, how then can any sort of national initiative be made effective to reduce that bureaucracy? Well, where we're at now is a, a, a situation where we have the opportunity to look at what are working, are working in different areas. And, and um, Keir's point around oh. having um, more concise advice, we should be at a point where now we're able to say, here are examples of good practice in a range of contexts. Because the fact is, we know that one size doesn't fit all. We can't just simply say every primary school in Scotland should do it this way because that takes away from the, the context of that establishment. But what we should have now through the inspection processes and through visits from all sorts of different people into establishments through local knowledge is examples of good practice which would then fit to a, a more concise group of um, contexts and then looking at, at that particular situation for your own establishment. I don't think what I'm describing um, in terms of local situations is terribly different from, from, from before. A lot of it is about <coughs> leadership within establishments and how confident they are in their own ability to articulate their school. Because very often what we hear from um, our members is, 
we have to keep a daily diary in a particular way and we have to keep our forward plans in a particular way and we have to keep our assessment folders in a particular way in case the inspector calls. Now, Education Scotland's inspectorate team guidance and advice has long since been very different from that. And it doesn't matter how many times I say it as education convener of the EIS, schools have still got in their heads in lots of ways this situation that if the inspector comes, I'm going to have to produce lots of evidence. The evidence should exist within a confident leader. The evidence should be that I am confident enough to say to you, this is where my school's at. How do I know it? Because I talk to my teachers and I talk to my young people. Do I keep lots of books about that? No, I don't. But I actually know and I speak to my parents and we, we know that. But we don't have that confidence for lots of people because they're living with, we haven't got that culture shift. We haven't got that culture shift because we hear in the press about um, situations or employers don't understand the new structures are all about. So we need to look at how we um, communicate what education is doing in Scotland in the, in the wider context so that everybody understands it. I've got teacher pals who don't understand the new qualification processes because they're an early years teacher. They've got young people who are going through secondary schools and they're saying to me, what is it? Yeah. There's, there's a problem in terms of the how we have uh, communicated that. Now, it's not that we haven't tried. There's loads of communication documents have gone through lots of different things. But for some reason or other, we haven't sold that. And I think that's partly because um, we, haven't had, we haven't got the time or space to get some of that culture shift in place. Thank you. Before I, I bring in Tavish, can I just welcome Gillian Martin? Gillian was given evidence at another committee this morning. That's why she's just arrived just now, and I should have mentioned that at the start of the meeting. Could I also uh, remind the committee members to uh, direct her questions to individuals, if, if, if that's the case, and also if we could both committee and panel keep the questions and answers as short as, as possible. We've got a lot to get through today. Tavish. Uh, supplementary, Mr. Bloomer, to uh, Colin Beattie's questions. You said there was no strategic plan and no coherence. Who's responsible for that and who should do it? Ultimately, that's government responsibility. So the Minister's office is where that sits, do you believe? Y yes, and I think that many of the things that the Cabinet Secretary has said recently indicate a desire to put a much stronger strategic framework in place and to tackle some of the problems that have been identified, some of those of, of bureaucracy that uh, uh, Susan has just been talking about. So there is maybe an understanding of that, but essentially it is a government task. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very briefly. And then, then Ross. Keir Bloomer's uh, statement about the, the uh, E's and O's um, and kind of whether or not they're all compatible, coherent, and whether or not the benchmarking actually is a sort of a, an additional um, uh, set of assessments. I mean, just was wanting to just ask Anne Grant and Susan Crean quickly, I mean, is, that, is that an assessment that you share or, or not? Because it's quite an important point. My understanding of the recently um, published benchmarks, which are only out for certain aspects of the curriculum at the moment, and they're to come out for the rest by the end of the... The, uh, by the end of the calendar year. My understanding of those is that they have subsumed the E's and O's and uh, also the significant aspects of learning. In other words, that's now the document I'm expecting my meet to, to be the working document. I'm expecting that I'll look at benchmarks and work, work on that with my staff right. and not look at, uh, now at E's and O's in, this, in, in the same detail and not look at significant yeah. aspects of learning. It's my understanding that they've been subsumed. <coughs> the, the ones that are out in literacy and numeracy um, has an in, have inter an interesting feature, which is there's bits in bold and italics, which are for all teachers, and there's bits in the, an ordinary font, which are for specific teachers of English um, for literacy and maths for numeracy, um, and so that uh, they've been conflated into one one document. Is, is the way I'm looking at it. I may be wrong, but that's the way I am approaching it. Clarification. And I would, I would agree. I think th those are the documents which now will be the key planning documents for schools. But they've only just come in in August. And 
for, for certain subjects and the other ones are not there yet. So we will still be talking about the E's and O's and the significant aspects of learning until establishments can, can get to grips with those. And that's, again, it's back to having the time and space to look at that and to look at what that means for your establishment um, in, terms of, in terms of the work you're doing. And again, it is one of the, the challenges around developments because schools will have developed and, and local authorities will have developed their improvement plans prior to the summer holidays yeah. to plan for what they are going to be doing with their development time for this year. And now we have something new. Now, that's something new should be helpful in terms of, in terms of what we're doing. But it does mean that we need to re establishments will need to revisit what their priorities were and, and find the time and space to actually to actually discuss those. Thanks very much, Ross. Thanks very much, convener. Um, following on from this theme of how we go about reducing um, bureaucracy, we had the cabinet secretary before the committee not all that long ago, emphasising that he does want to look at how we reduce bureaucracy and duplication and teacher workload. Um, in his statement to Parliament, he announced the creation of regional clusters. So I'd like to ask, you know, Anne is someone who's a head teacher, who's on the coal face of, of delivery. What's your understanding of how these regional clusters will work and what the relationship will be like um, between the region um, and the schools in particular? And has there been any engagement between you know, your school and your education authority and uh, edu Education Scotland in terms of a blueprint, in terms of how this might actually operate? Um, in terms of the... Your, the last part of your question, I haven't been engaged in any discussions about it um, with my education authority or Education Scotland. Um, I imagine that will happen, and I'm pretty sure it will happen. In terms of the uh, regional clusters, I think my understanding of them is that, that there will be uh, supportive bodies which will be there to um, ensure collegiality across councils. I think, uh, and again, this is my reading of it, I think that the, what the, um, the aim is that that if a, a council um, is doing well in a particular area um, and another neighbouring council or council somewhere close by, I suppose, is doing less well, then um, those councils can get together and share, share information. I do not see them, and I, I hope they'll not be, um, in any way in terms of governance. Um, my understanding is that it's about sharing information across councils rather than having actual governance. Mm -hmm. the, the whole notion of how this will develop in terms of governance and uh, the local authority role um, will be an interesting one. Obviously, that's something I could comment on if you want me to, but uh, maybe I shouldn't. Um, but, but in terms of the regional boards, I understand it to be very much a, a notion. And I think it's in response to the, the OECD document, which suggested that um, the, 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 the councils can learn from each other. Um, I think that already happens. I know that Glasgow is already linked with Fife, and there, there's sharing of ideas there in terms of um, the, way, the way we approach things. So I, I think it's, it's to do with sharing ideas rather than governance. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, for example, in the north-east of Scotland, uh, which I represent, we have the Northern Alliance, and again, where councils have been working with each other, particularly in relation to issues about teacher shortages and, and how we uh, work together to, to address those. Um, speaking to educationalists in both Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire, no, again, they don't have a very clear understanding of what it means, but think it could operate as a, you know, a board. Perhaps you have a joint QIO um, you know, who will go in and present challenge into the schools. So, how do we ensure that we do have greater collaboration where we can work together, but we're not adding in that additional layer of bureaucracy or management between the local education authority and uh, Scottish government? Is that achievable? I think it's achievable if what you do is you accept that you can use the same activity for multiple purposes. So if you think of, of, of one example of perhaps a, a regional board or, um, working is around moderation of standards. And so that will go on within an establishment. In, in a local authority, it should go on across establishments. And there now needs to be that out with your own authority. And I understand that Part of some of what's happening in terms of the, the regional boards is around um, working in that moderation aspect. So what you're doing is, the potential is there to say, well, actually, we're going to be doing a moderation exercise three times, because you're going to do it with your own school, and you're going to do it with your neighbouring schools, and now you're going to do it with people in other authorities. But you can actually use the, the one activity 
to do the, 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 to meet the three needs, and therefore you, you avoid that duplication, you avoid that over overworking of something. I think um, your idea of the, the joint QIOs and otherwise, I think that there, there needs to be consideration around that because certainly the support systems within local authorities are varied across the country, depending on their their own their own ability to, to provide the staff in those areas. It has been an area which has been hit um, by um, cuts to, to budgets within local authorities and decisions around um, around that. So again, if you have um, QIO, you know, rather than having a part-time QIO in, in a smaller authority, if you have a one across, a, you know, one full FT across a number, then that, that would make more sense to, to the system because what you would do is you would see that sharing of, of good practice and, and developing of understanding. Um, and Janet said, where we see developments is where teachers talk to each other. That's teachers, whether it's classroom-based, middle, senior management, or in the, in the um, strategic offices, where people talk to each other and not just in their own wee bubble, you see a sharing of good practice, you see a development of good practice within that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yes, of course, Mr. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you referred to education, uh, sorry, regional clusters. In fact, the governance review paper refers to school clusters and to educational regions, and they are two separate things in the, uh, in the review document. The first one is obviously a group of schools in a neighbourhood, uh, generally the secondary school and associated primaries and probably pre-five establishments within the, the, the same area. Um, the education regions appears to be the aggregate of a number of, of local authorities. The paper, I think, is a very fair one. It gives a concise uh, outline of governance in Scottish education as it currently stands, and it asks a number of quite open questions. Um, so it doesn't tell us all that much about clusters. It tells us even less about education regions. Uh, we are free in responding to this document uh, to make our own interpretation or our own, make our own suggestions as to what these might be and what they might do. That seems to me to be a perfectly fair approach to consultation. So I think it's difficult to answer your question at the present moment. We don't really know uh, what these regions will turn out to be. And at the outset of a consultation, I have no complaint about that. Um, I do, however, remain to be persuaded that there is any purpose to them whatsoever. Um, the Royal Society will respond to this consultation in due course. I, obviously, I can't at the present moment uh, anticipate precisely what we will say. But I think we are likely to be sceptical about what they will contribute that is additional and helpful. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Dr Brown, if we can pursue some SQA issues. The Cabinet Secretary was very clear in Parliament that you and he had had discussions about what was possible so as not to compromise the integrity of the exam system and obviously pupils' progress. Yet, not long after that, we find that unit assessments uh, are completely disappearing. Could you tell me uh, why you think that major U-turn has taken place? Um, when, I, when I was discussing with the Cabinet Secretary about um, removing units, the conversation around there was removing units and not doing anything to the further assessments that, were, that are in place. Um, what we are currently doing is, um, given the focus that uh, we, the, the feedback that we got back from our research and our, our field work was that there was over-assessment associated with the units, some of which was associated with the nature of the units themselves, others was as a result of uh, other issues such as has been discussed here actually, in terms of the preparation that candidates were getting in terms of broad general education, in terms of the amount of time being given to uh, the teaching and learning of the courses, and also in terms of the, the, the nature of the cohort present, being presented for the qualifications themselves. So in, in, in terms of how can we address that? How could that be addressed in terms of reducing workload? What we have done is we have looked at, is it possible 
by removing units and by looking at how you address the course assessment in general, that is the assignment that's undertaken and the final examination at the end of the year, it's possible to actually say, okay, the things that we've been assessing through the units, we're now going to assess through the course assignment and through the final examination. So what SQA is currently scoping and undertaking is uh, ways in which we can uh, make sure that we have full course coverage associated with the, the qualifications to maintain the credibility and the standard of those qualifications. And that means taking the things that were being assessed in units, looking at what needs to be added to the course assessment, whether it be an additional assignment, whether it be a strengthening of the assignment, or whether it being a strengthening of the examination. But I do want to emphasize that both the examination and the course assignment are absolutely compliant with the curriculum for excellence philosophy. One of the things that we talked about here is about uh, the flexibility that's necessary for kids in terms of their, their being able to learn appropriately and to be able to demonstrate their knowledge and skills in different contexts. The course assignment is things like projects, things like um, uh, work that they do in terms of science that allows them to demonstrate their knowledge and skills in different contexts that's done within the school environment, but that is sent to SQA to be externally marked, and hence that is where the quality assurance comes from. So that allows the flexibility um, still within the curriculum for excellence. Notwithstanding that flexibility, would you have some sympathy for the parents of those pupils who've already gone through these unit assessments to suddenly find out that obviously they're not particularly uh, rigorous or academically sound uh, and that, you know, that they're going to be dropped? And would you send a message to them that there might be some other reforms coming down the line um, which they might have to uh, adopt as well? First and foremost, the unit assessments are absolutely rigorous and absolutely so why have academically gone? sound. The, the philosophy here was if the way in which the unit assessments were being undertaken within the school sector meant that there was, and part of this is cultural shift, um, uh, and part of this is, is the nature and the way in which the unit assessments are being used, we had already planned to make some changes to the unit assessments that are in place for this current session, uh, which we believed would, would actually reduce the workload. But the decision has been made to say the approach to assessment now should not be with units and course assessments. It would only be on a course assessment. The units themselves, historically, are absolutely rigorous and absolutely appropriate. What we're doing is changing the way in which we assess candidates' knowledge and skills and moving that to the course assignment itself, that's the projects, for instance, and also to make sure that the exam has a greater course coverage than it's currently got. Could I just press you on that, Dr Brown, because you know, if, if you're a parent uh, who's being, being told that you know, they are rigorous and that they are very much uh, worth uh, academic pursuit, why have they disappeared, um, not given what you're saying about the, the flexibility, and are there other changes coming down the line? Uh, and no, there are no more changes coming down the line. We have, we are, we have uh, committed to the Cabinet Secretary that we will be doing National 5 for introduction in the following session, and then higher the following year, and then advanced higher the following year after that. But the, the, the issue on course assessments is the course itself is not changing. The nature of the course, the content of the course, the type of learning, the knowledge that the kids are going to be getting, the way in which they're going to be asked to demonstrate that knowledge in different contexts, the way they're going to be asked to apply that knowledge to problem solving, all part of the philosophy of curriculum for excellence is still there. The way in which SQA captures that experience and captures that knowledge is being changed from being three aspects, which was units, the assignment and the final examination, Two, only two now. So did they, did they go because the impression from schools was that they, that, you know, that they were a burden in terms of assessment? Yes, and, and in fact, that, that was a very strong piece of feedback that we got from our research that we've undertaken, which I think the committee has got a, a, a copy of okay. or has got a link to. Um, but th there are also other aspects as to why there, there was over-assessment being undertaken okay. in schools, and that was, that was also discussed at the assessment and national qualifications group that the Deputy First Minister chairs. Okay. Um, can I just move on to uh, when you were last at this committee, I think it was the 22nd of uh, September, uh, last year when we had a discussion about the integrity of the exam system in light of the problems that were experienced with the new hire 
and there have been some issues with human biology, I think, and uh, classics. At that time, you said uh, in, in your comments that you, you acknowledged that there had been some concerns, but you were utterly sure that the integrity of the exam system was 100%, uh, and that uh, you know, changes had been made to ensure that grade-related boundaries, etc., had, had all been uh, very carefully um, put in place. Could I just ask you about this uh, exam system? What process has gone through to ensure that papers are properly um, produced in the first place, properly moderated? And can you give a cast iron guarantee that that is always done by people who are experienced in that particular subject? First foremost, yes, I will. I, the, the people who are involved in the development of the question papers and the verification of the, very, uh, of the question papers are absolutely qualified. That, that is one of the criteria that we have. The, the advantage of the Scottish education system is the full participation of teachers. Every year we hire 15,000 appointees to not only develop the qualification, uh, the question papers and the assessments, but also to mark them. And that is, that is something that, that is absolutely essential. The teachers are part of the system. Yeah. We have quality assurance processes that we put in place. Um, as you say, there, 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 are, there have in the past been occasions where there have been uh, issues with, with question papers. Uh, I think Higher Maths was a couple of years ago. Um, one of the things we have done as a result of that experience and as a result of the, of the experiences this year is make sure that we uh, double our efforts to make sure that those quality assurance processes catch everything. So, so why did we have some problems with National 5 computing this year? As, as the, there were several issues associated with National 5 computing, and I have apologised um, for that, that question paper because I, I think it is a real challenge. Um, I, I think one of the things that we, we all need to recognise is that whilst SQA is developing qualifications, we're also delivering the live um, certification every year. And, and that, is, that remains a challenge for us in terms of being able to put the appropriate focus on. What we have done as a result of the experience both from last year and from this year, is to add additional steps in terms of a completely separate, uh, again, fully qualified group that look, look at the exam paper after the exam paper has been completed. So it's a complete fresh pair of eyes, fresh sets of eyes that actually look at that paper so that we, we actually can catch those things where people have been embedded in it for a long time, have not been able to do so. So when, when you advertise for people who you want to set papers and mark papers, you are confident that you have absolutely the right people all the time? Yes, because one of the things that we have from the Scottish teaching profession is very strong support for the SQA, and we look forward to that continuing. Okay. Um, can we know, would, it, would it be uh, helpful if um, Dr Brown was able to say whether we could access as a committee the quality guarantee about the um, setting of exams and marking of exams? Would, would that be possible to put that into the public domain? Uh, in terms of how we do the quality yes. assurance, yes, I'm quite perfectly that happy to provide that. I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. Julian, followed by Daniel. I suppose the other side of the coin is the issue around uh, Nat 4s. Um, and obviously there's been some discussion around um, the parents seeing less of a value in Nat 4 because it doesn't have an exam at the end of it. I'm interested in your views on that. I mean, I know I have my particular views of... of how student-centred is that approach if we were to actually make that for being a, an exam-based qualification? I mean, when, um, when the qualification stage of CFE was being developed, the IS um, and others within the, the system adopted the position that um, National 4 as the exit qualification for a, a group of young people wasn't best placed to have an external exam. And I, I, I think we would stand by that position at this time. In and of itself, it isn't the um, lack of an exam that has brought about the questions around National 4. There are a whole range of reasons why um, it's, it's not it's, it's not been seen as a qualification in and of its own right. And it's to, to simply add an exam back into it wouldn't would, wouldn't remedy that because the what the reason we the reasons we moved away from the exam was to do with equity it was to do with um, opportunities it was to do with the the, the life skills and approaches to that this group of young people would have so actually having an exam 
wouldn't in and of itself reverse what's ever there. It's back to the, the, the cultural shift. It's back to the understanding of employers and parents and other, other groups in terms of what the purpose of National 4 is. And we've had reported from, from, from our teacher colleagues that um, those young people for whom National 4 was going to be their exit um, felt um, demoralised because they didn't have an exam. And actually, when you drill down, it's not that they felt demoralised because they didn't have an exam. It was that they felt demoralised because so much um, focus was being put at school assemblies on those groups of people who were having exams, and that they, they were putting too much focus on those groups of young people who were going to have study leave to have their exams, and that they felt different as a result of that. It wasn't that they were asking for an exam. I'm fairly confident if you were to go to most fourth year pupils and say, do you want us to give you an exam in each of these subject areas, they would probably say, no, you're OK, thanks very much. So it's about how we present National 4 and it's about how we, we take it forward. I think the other issues around it um, can be considered as the um, assessment review group moves forward into their, their next stages in, in, in looking at that. I think they can look at whether or not there is a viability around having the value-added units externally assessed, and that might give some credibility to those who feel that it needs an external um, assessment component to it. I think you can be doing that, look at whether or not you extend the idea of just a pass-fail to having, you know, whether it's graded or whether it's a pass plus, pass, you know, looking at something around that. But I think those are for the assessment review group to take to their next, their next stages in, in the discussion around it. Because in and of itself, National 4 as an end qualification for those young people who are going to be leaving school at fourth year isn't a bad approach. It's in, in terms of um, the, the the principles behind it and the reasons why we, we moved away from the, the end exam, that, was, that still remains sound, in, in my opinion. It's now about how we um, promote that yeah. qualification as part of the bigger pathway package. And it is about looking at the wider qualification options for young people than just National Five and Higher are the be all and end all. And Janet and I have had this conversation many, many times. We have too big a focus in lots of ways around, and it's because we haven't got the culture shift and because it's really easy for the press to do it, but to judge a school purely on the numbers of hires and the numbers of young people going to university is to the detriment of those for whom that isn't the appropriate educational pathway. And we need to get a, a system where we are valuing every learning opportunity that a young person can have and recognising that we're not all the same and we can't all be the same. And it would be a shocking world if we were all the mm -hmm. same because we would be struggling if we didn't have people to do the wide range of jobs that we need in our societies. So, National 4, I, I wouldn't be going for an exam. I would be looking at how you actually promote that as an end qualification, part of a pathway. Schools reflecting on how they give, how they promote and how they encourage... Because at assemblies, it would just be they would be encouraging those students that were going for their exams. You know, they would be trying to G them up and maybe weren't they thinking, oh, there's maybe a group here that are feeling that they're not getting that exam leave. And if we move to a two-year qualification system, there wouldn't be any exams in fourth year. Everybody would be doing them in fifth year and sixth year. So you wouldn't have study leave, so they wouldn't be worried about it. No, I, I, I suppose it comes back to wider achievement as well. Um, so yeah. following on from that, um, a cultural shift in parents and Scottish society in general recognising wider achievement as attainment. I think, um, I, th th in terms of National 4, it's really, really important that we really think through what, what the country wants from National 4. 
and that, that should be done in a well-studied way. In fact, part of the, the next phase of research that we're doing is to look at National 4 and to solicit feedback from teachers, parents, from, from industry and from pupils, very importantly, on the nature of National 4. Um, in terms of internally assessed qualifications, and this touches on the point of, uh, of the broadening the curriculum, um, employers are very, very familiar with internally assessed uh, qualifications, and they are very happy with them. That's what the, vast, uh, the, the whole of the vocational space is made up of. So I think the challenge here is communication. A lot of it is challenged with parents. A lot of it, bluntly, is also challenged with teachers, because there's a lot of teachers that say they've got no credibility because that school down the road's not doing it properly. Their school's all, fi all fine, but the other school's not. So there's a lot of credibility issues within the profession, I think, on that. But I think the, the other aspect of it is to make sure that we do actually continue down the road of de developing Scotland's new workforce. Um, because I think those qualifications, those awards, are really, really valuable. There's awards there about p personal development. There's awards there about personal finance. There's awards that are entry-level national certificates into the vocational professions that are part of what we should be doing. And, and a school should be celebrating all of that. Parents should be celebrating all of that. One of the things we've done over the last couple of years is when we do put our, out our statistics, we put out everything that the schools undertake. Uh, we don't put out what's done throughout the year in colleges because not all, all of the kids get them at the, uh, uh, in August. They've actually done qualifications throughout the year through the college engagement. We as a, as a nation need to start to recognise that we need to celebrate all of that. And, and it doesn't help when we continuously focus on the higher pass rate. Yeah. Um, because not, a higher is not, a higher is brilliant but not if that's not what you want to do, if you want to do something else. Uh, yesterday, I think a lot of you may have been at the, the College Scotland event, and, and if you talk to some of the young people in there and the, and the work that they're doing in terms of their apprenticeships and, the, and, the, and the, the things they're studying, they're able to do that and start on that route through SQA qualifications, through the school, through the college, and actually we need to be celebrating that as much. But it's really important that we think through what are the quali qualifications for and what skills and knowledge do they give the kids and how is it best to assess them so that we actually understand their abilities. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Tavish, you've got a brief... A quick supplementary to Dr Brown. I mean, I agree with that last point strongly, not least which because I was at uh, Murray College in Richard's constituency last night because my son's there, just graduating, or, or uh, if that's the right phrase. But actually, I'm now totally confused because you've made a very good argument about wider achievement, but we're being pushed down attainment and assessment. How are these things compatible and consistent? Um, my view is... Uh, Scotland needs to understand where people are, where people exist. The word assessment is, seems to be a dirty word in some scenarios. What we're talking about here is making sure that you can actually assess uh, that learner's abilities, their knowledge, their skills, and assess it to standard. How that standard is assessed can be done in multiple different ways. That, is, that in, in, uh, as we've just discussed, in, in, in the new uh, approach to national fives and hires, that's going to be done through an assignment and through an examination. But it's equally possible to do that through internal assessment. And it is the judgment of Scotland that needs to decide how it wants to assess its candidates and its, and its learners, whether they're aged, well, whether they're in, in primary, secondary, or in uh, the senior phase. And is the logic of that that we end up being able to compare on, the, on a data basis school against school? I don't, I, 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 uh, don't think that that's helpful. Uh, I, mm. I personally think that what we need to do is understand yeah. the, 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 where a child is, where a learner is, whether the learner's you know, eight or whether they're 62, mm -hmm. because that is actually what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve a development of yeah. that individual that then helps them in the next phase of their life. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. Daniel? Um, again, I'm just wanting to follow on with your, your, your comments to Liz Smith's uh, line of questioning uh, about uh, the change to unit assessments. I mean, uh, previously we had the, the chief examiner on the record saying that we couldn't go any further on, on unit assessments without compromising standards. I was just really wondering kind of well, what, what, what's changed or what, what's being done to, to compensate for that and just maybe just a bit more of an expansion on how, how we mean maintaining standards um, w with this change that's coming through. When I, when I said I was unable to move any further, that is because there was no plan, there was no, um, there was no um, focus on modifying the other assessments other than units. The focus was just remove units, 
and certificate. You cannot do that and maintain the credibility no. and the standards. So what we've and the reason it cannot be implemented immediately is because we need to go back and we need to look at what we're assessing in the units and now take that and put that in either the assignment that is being undertaken within the school, whether it's a new assignment that needs to be put in place, and whether we need to strengthen and increase the coverage that exists within the examination itself. Okay, so, I mean, given that, and I think, you know, when you talk to schools and you, you appreciate just the, the volume of assessment that was going on mm -hmm. with unit assessments, I mean, I think I had a school class in yesterday and they were giving me the number and it was a bit mind-boggling. So, I mean, I understand the driver for this, but are we shifting the workload on us? Are we going to see an increase in workload for teachers uh, in, in terms of assignments, or is there, is, and is there going to be an increase in resource requirement from the SQA in terms of external assessment of these bits of work? And, and are you confident that you've got that resource on hand to be able to, to deliver the, the, this increased requirement for, for assessment? Well, I, I think there's two things. The assignments are done within the classroom, and I think that, that's, that should be part of teaching and learning. It's about the change in the pedagogy. It's about the nature of how a kid uh, actually demonstrates their knowledge and their skills and applies that knowledge and skills. Uh, in terms of it, uh, as if we increase the amount of, of the assignment or if we add an assignment to those qualifications that currently don't have one, yes, SQA will require additional external markers to be able to do that. That is the engagement that we have with the profession every year. That is the appointees that we appoint. Uh, similarly, if, the, uh, if we have to add additional um, aspects to the examination itself, to the question papers, that may mean that we need more markers again. So yes, we need to be able to look at that. One of the things we are currently doing is, is continuing our discussions with, with the, the teaching uh, professional bodies to make sure that everybody participates in the system. There are values that there is, and, and I'm sure um, other members of the, of the panel will agree, there is very strong value to teachers participating in SQA activities. Because one of the, one of the challenges here is ensuring that every single teacher in Scotland and understands the standards. Uh, and I think that's very, very key. If you become a marker for SQA, you absolutely do do that. And there's a great deal of professional development uh, associated with that. We're working with GTCS to make sure that that's recognised. So it's, it is that increased requirement that's likely to be there. But we are looking, therefore, at freeing up the teacher's time within the classroom in terms of not doing the unit assessments. Uh, how, how, so there's two further questions there. First of all, so you, we do need additional markers in order to, to compensate. I mean, I mean, roughly, I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, I mean, is this a big jump? I mean, how confident are you you can find them, and how big a change is that going to be? Well, first and foremost, we don't know how big a change it is yet because yeah. it is quite a complex issue to look at what's being assessed, subject by subject, level by level, within each with with within National Five higher. A look at what needs to be moved from units into either an assignment or into the uh, course assessment. So I cannot give you that information right now. We're currently in that planning phase. One of the things we've been doing over the past few years is really encouraging teachers to participate. We had a full complement of teachers last year. I know there's been some issues associated with the workload that has um, had some uh, concerns expressed within the unions. But as that goes away, we believe that the unions and the, uh, the teaching profession will again fully participate in the SQA's activities because it is beneficial for everyone. Sure. The system is run by all of us in sure. Scotland. So, I mean, given the fact that you need qualified teachers in order to be markers, and, and given that this is a, a, a workload issue, and given that it, teachers are finite to the extent that you can't instantly create new, there's, there's a time lag to create new teachers, are, is there a, a danger that we're just sort of pushing that workload problem ran to another part of the system and that actually we're, we're, we're still going to be asking teachers to do more work but just in a, as appointees rather than you know as in their role as teachers um the appointee role is undertaken outside of school hours and is fully compensated by sqa but it, but it might well be the same people doing the same it, it, same work but just under a different mode of employment um, but again, that, that is the way that the system runs today. That, that sure, I don't teachers that, teachers volunteer just... to do this on a regular basis. I think um, the, the dangers out there around workload are that um, what, what teachers have expressed to us around the unit assessments is that 
they were frustrated by the duplication of, of assessment within unit assessments and coursework and exams. And we provided, um, as an organisation, a, a significant document which came from our members in relation to what was already there in, within it. So in terms of what will now migrate from the unit assessments into the coursework or otherwise, will vary in, in quantity depending on the subject and depending on what's there. Your, your comments around just moving the workload, I suppose, from our point of view, if, if an individual teacher wants to continue to volunteer to do paid overtime, if you like, with SQA, that's their choice and their decision. Um, but what we have with the, with the potential changes to the system is that their workload within their contracted job will be more manageable. And more importantly, it will be more manageable for the young people. Because actually at EIS AGM in the last two years, the more moving um, speeches that were made were not related to teacher workload. Yes, they were, they were clearly our predominant thing, but were teachers who were referencing their young people struggling with the level of workload related to that particular aspect of it. So we are, as an organisation, comfortable that the unit assessments in and of themselves may well still help to structure courses and to, 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 to be, play a part but if they're not a mandatory part of the, the, the qualification, you won't be redoing them and redoing them and redoing them. And that in itself will, it will help. If that means that people then feel more comfortable about going back to working with the SQA outside of their, their contracted hours, then that, that will be their, their choice. But at the moment, that, that, was, that was the key issues for us. You know, I'm not um, disagreeing with the fact that the, the unit assessments were over-demanding in certain aspects. That's one of the things we did um, find when we, when we did our research. But the, the, the amount of assessment and the amount of workload for pupils also needs to be looked at in terms of the time that's available to do these courses. There is an assumption, for instance, in National 5, that a candidate, will have, that, that, that a candidate for a National 5 will have been um, secure at curriculum level four before entering that course. And then that course requires 160 hours of learning teaching. And if that's not available for that candidate, no matter whether you take the units out or not, you will not actually improve that experience of that candidate. And that's back to your curriculum architecture. Sure. That's back to the original principles around what was intended and what was, what was the design brief of CFE at that stage. Will be. Finally, we've got Ross Greer. Thanks, Convener. I'd like to ask uh, Anne Grant and perhaps Susan Quinn specifically around uh, personal, social and health education and curriculum for excellence. Uh, C3 is uh, about creating confident, well-rounded individuals, but this core area doesn't seem to have caught up. The Time for Inclusive Education campaign found that about half of teachers weren't aware of government-funded uh, resources on dealing with issues around homophobia, LGBT issues. 80% of teachers didn't feel confident in those areas. The Scottish Youth Parliament's found similar concerns from young people themselves around mental health, either in educating young people about it or in supporting them through it. Um, I'm wondering, do you think that we need a significant refresh in personal and social education because it's not caught up with the rest of society and with the aims of curriculum for excellence? I think as uh, teachers in early years, primary, and in my case in secondary, the, the importance of, of looking after young people cannot ever be underestimated. One of the things I, 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 I genuinely deeply believe is that the, the job of a teacher is to be someone who looks after other people's children. And the trust that parents give to us in, in doing that is, is something that we hold really, really dear. And I think the, the whole notion of uh, how a young person develops and grows, it's, it's fine, we can talk about attainment, we can talk about examinations, we can talk about wider achievement in terms of offering young people opportunities. But I think everyone, Everyone in my school and I think everyone in society would want to make sure that young people feel safe, they feel cared for and they feel happy. 
And that's that's basically the way we we operate in, in Shawlands, and it's something that um, it's something that we've worked on very hard on, very hard about, and it's very much to do with the values we consider ourselves a values um, a values based school. I think what you say about personal education is really important, um, and in fact, mental health issues are a, a significant aspect for young people today. Um, <clears throat> the resources we have to support young people are there to some extent. That's maybe a, an issue that we could look at more because of the because of, because of the way the resources are just now. In terms of in terms of the kind of support that a young person can have from their pastoral care teacher, from a teacher who just listens and cares, can be um, really significant in terms of life. And I think that that's something that should never be um, forgotten about or undervalued. Likewise, in terms of <clears throat> issues to do with sexuality, that's a, again, we, in a secondary school, we, we, we're looking after young people within that stage of their life when that's actually often something that they're recognising um, about themselves. And again, that's very, very significant. Um, as a school, we, we undertook on one of the in-service days at the beginning of August, we had uh, three hours of LGBT training. We had trainers in um, because we recognised that in terms of the diversity of Shawlands Academy, um, we recognise that it's, a, it's an incredibly diverse community in so many different ways, and we were responding to different needs. And, and, but where we responding to that need? So we addressed that, and we're looking at that uh, in terms of uh, the way we approach young people in our school. And it's been, it's been a significant aspect of the way we work in the school, and I'm sure that's something that's going to happen across all schools in Scotland. Um, in, in terms of, of, of the wider need to, to refresh, I think you, you're probably correct. There probably is a need to look at, at, at that as, a, as a, an area. I think what we need to reflect is that um, very often um, there is a, a, a key initiative and that gets a, a lot of publicity, whether it's press or within establishments or within local authorities or otherwise. And there's a push around that area. And then unfortunately, the next big thing comes along and, and we haven't found ways to make sure that we keep momentum around all of these areas. And quite often we forget that um, schools refresh. So, you know, I think back to receiving um, very clear and very um, sound training in, in anti-racist education. It was, 20 years ago. Um, lots of teachers won't have received that again because that won't have been necessarily revisited because we've done it. So we don't necessarily have time. And it's back to that creating the time and space to fit things in. So you need to look at what are the absolutes in terms of still needing to, to be there. Do we still need to be doing an hour a week of handwriting in the primary sector when most of our young people will use technology? Do we, how do we create time and space in, in, in looking at these things to allow it to, to be part of um, a more integrated system so that it isn't add-ons? Because I think that's where things fall off. If it's just added on and doesn't become an integral part of it, it can happen to fall off if things start to spin a wee bit faster. So I think that there's, there, is a, there is a key area to look. I think in terms of some of these wider um, health um, issues, it is then about the, the whole GERFEC approach and how we can engage much more with um, wider partners. And, and the challenges around that when, when everybody's stretched because Partnership work takes time. Partnership work requires individuals to have the time to talk to each other and to plan and to see who's going to be involved in things. And if you are struggling as a head teacher or a deputy head or a principal teacher, if you're struggling as a social work department or a third sector organisation, then it becomes more difficult to organise it. But clearly where there is um, examples of good practice in terms of engaging with third sector partners in particular in relation to um, <coughs> young people's mental health issues, that in and of itself can make it not an add-on, but an integral part of the, 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 the whole 
of the of the establishment and and the, the system. Thanks very much. And just very briefly, going back to Anne Grant's point about the training that you facilitated at, at Shawlands, is it then a, an issue often of inconsistency because it comes down to individual leadership within schools and presumably in your case, the decision to allocate part of your budget to getting that kind of training facilitated? Um, I think that in, in, we've talked about collegiality a lot today and I think that in terms of, in terms of uh, identifying issues, it really is very much... Um, we have to respond to the needs within our schools. Um, Susan spoke about anti-racist education. That's embedded. It's part of the nature of everything that we do in Sean's Academy. Um, and likewise with other aspects, because we are very much with, with regard to our values. So in terms of the LGBT training, that was something which we had um, evaluated, looked at and decided that we needed to do that. And I think it's important that schools are given that opportunity to be able to respond to needs within their own communities. And it's also something that we respond to, as I said previously, we respond to nationally. There, ha there, has, there have been national initiatives and there, are, there have been talks about that. And as society, as society changes, schools have to be able to respond to that. So there is a, there's, a, there's an element, of, so I suppose it's a balance between responding to the needs that you recognise within your own school um, and your own community but also responding to national um, initiatives and the way society, the way society changes. And schools have to, schools have to re reflect and respond to the changes in society. We are, after all, engaged in looking after the young people who will be society in the future. I, I take that point. My concern would be that the schools who maybe don't feel that they have a need for that are perhaps the ones with the greatest need, particularly on an issue like LGBT issues. I, again, that, I, I would imagine the, the way that would be resolved, although that, because I'm responsible for a school, I'm responsible for that, but um, the, the responsibility for that, I would imagine, would go beyond into um, the, the, the local authority monitoring it, discussing what's happening, knowing that if schools are doing it, schools are responding, why other schools aren't, and it could take us back to that um, the regional board where people can look across the way. I imagine that's the way things will, will, will happen. I certainly hope it is. There are ways and means also used in school improvement planning processes within a local authority for a local authority to direct in terms of... So school improvement plans very rarely are wholly school improvement plans. The vast majority of a, a school's improvement plan will be national or local priorities. So within local authorities, they will often say in, in their advice each year, you're, you're going to have no more than three priorities, one of which needs to be the national priority on raising attainment. They could say one of which needs to be that you review your um, PSE programmes and to take account of current positions in this, and the third one's up to the school. So very often local authorities will give direction in terms of that if it's something that's that's identified, whether it's nationally or locally, as a priority. It won't necessarily just be left up to a school to identify it through their self-evaluation processes. That's one of the cries from establishments um, very often now is that their school improvement plan really isn't their school improvement plan. It's, um, it's how they're going to respond to national and, and local issues. Now, what you would have locally that wouldn't be assignable to one of those things, I, I, I would probably question. But there are ways and means of making sure that key issues are in improvement plans and taken forward. Just to pick up Susan's point, the, in, within Shorlands, the one of the key aspects is, uh, for improvement plan is inclusion. And it's within that heading that we've responded to that. Inclusion is part of Glasgow City Council's uh, agenda. So it, it, it's, it's, it's come through that way. Thanks very much. OK, Ross, you wanted to come in briefly. Yeah, just briefly touching on from Ross's question and um, the answer um, from Susan around about the, um, the improvement plan. I know obviously uh, local authorities work with each school to put those in place um, and often they're obviously set for a year, sometimes they, you know, they, they look further ahead. Um, I know in my own area, um, when we looked at trying to make changes to try and get some teacher training in and about the dangers, the new dangers pre presented by legal highs at that time, how it can be really difficult. So the school tried to do something slightly different rather than include it in the plan. But I think touching on for Ross's part shows there's an inconsistency, I suppose, across local authority about what they determine is a priority or not. And um, on something as fundamental as that, how do you think we can try and get greater consistency uh, across uh, local authorities um, in relation to ensuring that that sort of inclusivity is included within their plans? Yeah. 
Um, I imagine that organisations will respond to the current governance review mm -hmm. in ways that will hopefully address that question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that the, the governance review raises implicitly, although it's not one of the questions uh, posed by the government, is how desirable is local variation? Um, one of the principles that has underpinned governance in Scottish education up until now, certainly as set out in the 1980 Act, which is still the base legislation as far as uh, education is concerned, is that the principal um, agent of governance is the local authority. And that that is an expression of local democracy. Uh, and local democracy obviously entails that priorities can differ from one council area to another. Um, I think that it is uh, increasingly evident that in relation to education, the public actually doesn't believe that. And that may well come out uh, of the governance review. But so long as that is uh, the legal position, as currently it is, then we have to accept the fact that there will be significant variation from one local authority area to another. Yeah, no, I absolutely appreciate that. You don't want to be dictating to every school what they should be including within their local improvement plan. It's just, I suppose it's understanding when something is fundamental, as issues Ross uh, raised, how we ensure there is that equality, I suppose, in, in the... My view would be that a school improvement plan should be the school's improvement plan, and that, that is a pretty straightforward concept. Uh, and incidentally, just to uh, give a more general answer to Mr Greer's question, and not specifically related to the issues that he raised, the orthodoxy in Scotland is that the most uh, powerful way of improving the education system is by improving the quality of teaching. And indeed, that globally is the view as expressed by OECD. I think it's very much open to question. It seems to me that important though the quality of teaching is, there is something that is actually more important in a school, and that's the nature of its culture and the quality of the relations among the people who are attending there, learners and teachers and so forth. Thank you very much for that can of worms, just as we we're about to close the session. Uh, can I thank the panel for their uh, very good contribution today? That was that was. Excellent. I'm sure we all took a lot from it. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I, I'd like to welcome all those students who came in five minutes ago who were just about to ask to leave as, <laughs> as the public session is just coming to an end. Uh, and if you could just clear the gallery, please. Thank you once again. Thank you.